continuing with our podcasts on nerve and the nervous system. We've talked about neurons, we've talked about dendrites and axons, we've talked about synapses. What I'd like to do now is talk about some of the supporting cells or neuroglial cells in the nervous system. And we can talk about the central nervous system neuroglial cells as astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, microglial cells, and ependymal cells. Now, astrocytes function to provide physical and metabolic support for neurons. They contribute to the blood-brain barrier in the central nervous system. We can talk about two classes of astrocytes, fibrous astrocytes and protoplasmic astrocytes. These are actually probably different phenotypic expressions of the same cell type. Individually, it's tricky to recognize fibrous versus protoplasmic astrocytes if you were to try to identify the individual cells. However, it is easy to pick out histologically white matter and gray matter. So we can always tell that if we've got astrocytes and white matter, those are going to be fibrous astrocytes, whereas the protoplasmic astrocytes are going to always be those astrocytes within gray matter. Oligodendrocytes are a special type of glial cell that myelinate axons within the central nervous system. The microglial cells are resident macrophages within the central nervous system. These cells are actually derived from monocytes. And then the ependymal cells. The ependymal cells line the brain ventricles and they line the central canal of the spinal cord. Ependymal cells are a cuboidal or a columnar shaped epithelial like cell. They primarily absorb cerebrospinal fluid, but within the choroid plexus, these ependymal cells are modified to secrete cerebrospinal fluid. So these are the glial cells within the central nervous system. Within the peripheral nervous system, we talk about satellite cells and Schwann cells. Satellite cells provide physical and metabolic support for the neuron cell bodies in ganglia. Schwann cells myelinate axons in the peripheral nervous system, and they support both myelinated and unmyelinated axons. And we'll show you some micrographs and diagrams of that in just a few minutes. This is just a cartoon to highlight some of the glial cells within the brain. So you can take this hypothetical piece of the brain and you can look at some of the glial cells in relation to a big neuron. So here's a neuron. Here you can see some ependymal cells like this. You can see some astrocytes like this. You can see oligodendrocytes, which are making the myelin that would wrap around the axons in these neurons. You can see some microglial cells. Now, of course, there are blood capillaries in the central nervous system, so you would expect to find cells like pericytes and, of course, smooth muscle in the capillary. This cartoon shows an oligodendrocyte like this, just indicating that a single oligodendrocyte is wrapping myelin around multiple different axons within the central nervous system. And here the cartoon just showing a node of Ranvier. And I think you appreciate a node of Ranvier as a non-myelinated area within a myelinated axon. I'll have more to say about that in just a couple of minutes. The top panel just shows a cartoon of microglial cells and then the histological view of microglial cells. Microglial cells are not that easy to pick up histologically, but they do kind of look like this fusiform cell, almost like a fibrocyte. So if you see cells like this that are long spindle-shaped cells in the central nervous system, there's a good chance that they're microglial cells. I'm not talking about them just yet, but look at this neuron. Is a multipolar neuron, uh, cell body like this, uh, nucleus like that. Uh, and then ependymal cells shown on the bottom panel. These are ependymal cells that happen to be lining the central canal in the spinal cord. And you can see the ependymal cells like that. And you can see them at the electron microscopic level. And they do put out some microvilli processes and they do put out some cilia. 
is a protoplasmic astrocyte in gray matter and a fibrous astrocyte in white matter. You don't have to worry that much about the staining. This is a specialized fluorescence confocal microscopic preparation to demonstrate these protoplasmic astrocytes. The fibrous astrocytes in the white matter are stained with antibodies to gliofibrillary acidic protein. You may have heard of that as an important protein that forms some of these neuro fibrillary plaques in diseases like Alzheimer's. You don't need to worry about these types of stainings. You don't have to really worry about identifying protoplasmic or fibrous astrocytes, except that you would recognize them by knowing if you're in gray or white matter. The point I want to make here is in both cases, these astrocytes, notice they're putting out foot processes on to the blood vessels. And of course, this is just an artist rendition, but there are huge numbers of these foot processes that essentially totally surround the blood vessels and these give rise to the blood-brain barrier both in the gray matter and in the white matter. So the astrocytes very important in giving rise to the blood-brain barrier. I'm going to jump from the central nervous system to, to the peripheral nervous system because I want to talk about Schwann cells and I want to talk about myelination. And here we're going to talk about myelination on axons in the peripheral nervous system. You should remember that Schwann cells develop from the neural crest. It so happens they develop under the influence of the SOX10 genes. I don't know if you talked about that in your embryology. I'm not going to hold you responsible for that, but it's just interesting to understand that the Schwann cells do come from neural crest cells and they're under the influence of SOX10. Now the myelination process is rather interesting and it's complicated to understand it in a three-dimensional manner, so I'll do the best I can with these two-dimensional images to talk about it in this podcast. Basically, myelination starts as an axon lies within a groove of the Schwann cell. And as that happens, the Schwann cell becomes polarized to form two distinctly different functional membrane domains. There's what's called an ab axonal domain which faces the external environment and there's an ad axonal domain which is in direct contact with the axon. Now when the Schwann cell completely encloses an axon just by one wrapping you form a structure that's called a mesaxon. That's the point where the Schwann cell cytoplasms come together as the Schwann cell has wrapped around an axon. Now this uh, molecule NRG1, I'm not going to hold you responsible for that, that's a growth factor that helps to determine how thick a myelin sheath will be within myelinated axons. Now the tricky thing to understand here is that myelination is created as the mesaxon wraps around the axon in a spiraling motion and as it does that specific myelin proteins or myelin specific proteins get expressed. Some of these myelin-specific proteins, again, I'm not going to hold you responsible for the names, but for example, they're given the names POMBP and PMP22. These are myelin-specific proteins. We know that mutations in the genes that code for some of these myelin-specific proteins can be very significant in causing demyelinating diseases. One thing I want to point out, and this is something that's very difficult to appreciate histologically and even looking at electron micrographs, but you see it a lot on board exams. People talk about the major dense line and the interperiod line within a myelin sheath. And this diagram is a really good way to visualize this. Imagine that as the mesaxon is wrapping around the axon itself, so the Schwann's cell is wrapping around the axon, the cytoplasm is being squeezed out between membranes of the Schwann cell. The little bit of cytoplasm between the Schwann cell membranes contributes to what's called the major dense line. And so in the cartoon, the major dense lines are just shown as these 
dense black lines. The interperiod line is the extracellular space between those membranes as the membranes coil around the axon. This is what it looks like in the early stages of myelination. Here's an unmyelinated axon shown here, and here's an axon that's early in the process of myelination. You can see basal lamina like this. You can see basal lamina here. This is the profile of a Schwann cell, and the Schwann cell would be wrapping myelin around this axon. You can see an outer mesaxon profile like this near the uh, axon itself, and then the inner mesaxon. And this particular axon, it's very early in the myelination process. There's maybe about six layers of myelin that are wrapped around this. This is a very much higher power view of myelination. Just pick out the major dense lines on the interperiod lines. And on this micrograph, this would be the axon, and this would be the outer mesaxon region of the Schwann cell. I'm not going to ask you on an exam to highlight the interperiod lines or the major dense lines on the myelinated axon. The myelin sheath is segmented because it is formed by numerous Schwann cells that are arrayed along the length of an axon. And I think you appreciate the node of Ranvier is a junction where two Schwann cells meet along an axon, and at that junction the axon is actually devoid of myelin. The regions of the axon that are wrapped within myelin are called the internodal segments. So here's a node of Ranvier like this, a myelin sheath, another node of Ranvier like this, my, myelin sheath. So this would be an internodal segment of the axon, another internodal segment of the axon. So here a node of Ranvier, here a node of Ranvier. This is actually a bare region of the axon. No myelin, just like the initial segment of the axon has no myelin. This is very important for the generation and conduction of the action potentials down the axon. As a Schwann cell membrane winds around an axon, most of the Schwann cell cytoplasm is extruded from between the opposing layers of membrane. Remember that interperiod line. Some cytoplasm does remain in what are called Schmidt, Lantum, and Clefts, and in perinodal cytoplasmic islands. That is extremely difficult to visualize. If you were to conceptually unroll the Schwann cell, the cytoplasm of the Schwann cell is going to be continuous through these Schmidt lantum and clefts and through this perinodal cytoplasm. And let's just go to this part of the image first. So here's an axon, and here would be like if you were envisioning unwrapping the myelin from this axon. Picture that you've got a jelly roll, and you're unrolling the jelly roll. So the axon is like you know, the middle of the jelly roll, and so this is the Schwann cell that's being unwrapped. This is the myelin, which is shown in the electron micrograph like this. Here's this perinodal cytoplasm like this near the nodes of Ranvier, so perinodal cytoplasm here if that's a node, if that's another node, perinodal cytoplasm here, and then the schmidt lanterman clefts would be somewhere internal to the nodes of Ranvier. Here, just at a light microscopic level, you can see the axons you can see the very dense myelin staining with this type of a stain at the light microscopic level. Here's the node of Ranvier. Here's a diagrammatic view, kind of in a longitudinal section. So these would be the pieces of the Schwann cell forming the myelin that's wrapping around the axon. So here's the node of Ranvier, like this. Here would be some of the myelin sheets, like this. Here would be some of the schmidt lantman clefts. So here's the deal. Here's the intense myelin sheaths. Look at these membrane wrappings around this portion of the axon. Notice how there's much less membrane wrapping around the node of Ranvier, much less membrane wrapping at the Schmidt, Lantum, and Clefts. Here, again, it's hard to visualize this, but here's a real histological image. I'm tracing like this the axon. See like that. Here's the axon. Here's the myelin. 
like this. Here is a node of Ranvier. So notice the myelin sheath is much narrower at this region. So this is an internodal segment. Here's another internodal segment. Now look at these structures that look like that. They almost look like little spines on arrowheads. You can see them there. You can see some here. Those would be the Schmidt lantern and clefts. And you can get a little bit of a sense near the dark arrow of something here. This would be the perinodal region. So that's kind of to give you a sense of what the myelin wrapping would look like. Now, of course, we also said that Schwann cells support unmyelinated axons. It turns out that axons in the peripheral nervous system are going to be enveloped by Schwann cells, even if they're unmyelinated. So the cartoon here is showing one, two, three, four, five, six axons in the cartoon that are enveloped by the Schwann cell, but there's not a lot of myelin wrapping around these axons. So look at these axons. These are unmyelinated axons enveloped, enveloped by and supported by a Schwann cell. The arrows pointing out the mesaxons of the Schwann cells. Here's a myelinated axon, uh, or a profile thereof, of a myelinated axon here. Here on the edge of the micrograph would be the myelin sheet of another myelinated axon. And here you can just see some of the basal lamina that's surrounding the entire unit of the Schwann cells with the axons. Here just showing some neuron cell bodies and paravertebral ganglion, just to make the point that the cell bodies are surrounded by satellite cells. Remember, the satellite cells are also supporting cells. These help to maintain a controlled microenvironment for the neuron cell body. At the higher magnification, you can see the satellite cells surrounding the cell body. So here's the, the cell body itself. Here are the satellite cells. These would be little profiles of the axons. Uh, in the lower power micrograph, you can actually see some of the cell bodies where you can see a nucleus and a nucleolus. Formation of the myelin sheath in the central nervous system, of course, occurs by oligodendrocytes. One oligodendrocyte can wrap around many axons. The process of myelination is similar to what occurs in the peripheral nervous system, but it's physically and mechanically more complicated. I'm not going to even begin to even attempt to describe how the myelination wraps around the axons in the central nervous system. There are differences in myelin-specific proteins that are expressed in oligodendrocytes as opposed to the myelin-specific proteins that are expressed in Schwann cells. The differences in some of these myelin-specific proteins of the central nervous system may be involved in the pathogenesis of some autoimmune diseases. That's something that we're not going to talk about here. You may encounter that later in your clinical training.